Hi and welcome back. Today we're going to have a bit of a look at uh, VAC Station 2000. Um, this was a early workstation produced by Digital, um, brought out in 1987 and it usually came with a monochrome monitor, usually a 19 inch this is about the smallest fax machine you can get, uh, but they're built very solidly because they've got to hold the weight of a very heavy monitor. I don't have the monitor with this, it's long gone, but uh, you can still use them fine just with a normal terminal. Having a closer look, uh, this one has got a door at the front where you normally access tape drives and things like that, but this particular model's got a hard drive fitted. Around the back we've got the power of course, um, two Ethernet connectors. This is the thick wire AUI port. This is a thin wire port and there's a switch here that selects between the two. Um, along the top or underneath here we've got various connectors. There's a serial port here. This is the connection for the monitor. The printer port which also doubles as a console port and this is a reset button. The most important thing, of course, is the carry handle. You always need a carry handle on your, on your back station. To use the console port on this, you need a special cable, a BCC08, which is this one here. This particular unit hasn't been powered on for a few years, so what I was going to do today was take it apart and remove the battery, which is probably leaking, and just check um, various capacitors in the power supply just to make sure nothing's gone awry out there. The first step is to remove these four screws, two, three and four. It's all very modular. Uh, power supply is here. This is all the system boards and memory boards. And this is the hard drive. I think it's an RD54, which is 159 megabytes. The next step is to get the system module out. There's a screw at the front, two at the back, and one on each side. This lifts up, and there's some cables up the back that need to be disconnected before the module can be removed. Okay, the cable's been removed, and this will just come off, leaving the power supply and the hard drive. Just a quick look at the back. The three things I had to unplug were the MFM hard drive connector here, the power, and the connector to the Ethernet at the back. This is the battery that I wanted to remove, and there's a memory board there. Okay, I got the battery out. A little bit of corrosion around the connector, but apart from that, pretty good. Now I've got to slide the hard drive forward so that I can get to the power supply. Okay, the hard drive's out. Big old monster, it's full height drives. Another four screws on the bottom and the power supply will slide out. Now I just need to remove these clamps and a couple of screws around and the tamper proof torques just to annoy us. This all looks pretty good inside, uh, all the capacitors look fine, uh, no sign of any reefer capacitors in there so I think I should put it back together and give it a test. Now we'll check a few voltages just to make sure it's okay and uh, display it on my retro multimeter. Minus three and a half, plus five, plus five, 11.3, and minus five. I thought before I put it back together I'd spin up the hard drive and just see if it sounds alright. Sounds a bit rough and the, uh, the seek doesn't sound correct but anyway we'll put it back together and see what happens. Almost back together now. Uh, this sheet is an insulating sheet, so you've got to make sure that's in place. Okay, time to fire it up, see what happens.
Gordon Emanuel, F is base video. E is the system clock. D is non-volatile RAM. C is the serial line controller. B is the memory test. So we'll sit here for a while testing the memory. A is the memory management unit. 9 is the floating point unit. 8 is the interval timer. 7 is the disk controller. 6 is the tape controller. 5 is the interrupt controller and Ethernet. 4 is the graphics card, if it has one. If we had a graphics monitor, it would probably be displaying test patterns on there now. Three and two are reserved, and one is Ethernet. It's got a question mark because I haven't got the Ethernet plugged in. Okay, let's try and boot it. I don't think it'll work because of the way that disk sounds there. Sounding rather sick. Stop that. Let's run the disk verifier. Disk zero recognizes that it's an RD54. Uh, so yes, go for it. Doesn't sound happy. Okay, so it looks like this one's got a faulty hard drive in it. I'll have to uh, see if I can do something about that. But I think that's as far as I can go with this machine. For those that are disappointed that I couldn't get it working and demonstrate it, here's one I prepared earlier. And this one works. This is a lot quieter, which is good. And that's the sound you should hear. And we're off and running. The 2000 is only a 0.8 button machine and has no cache, so it's very slow. This machine only has 6 mega memory as well, so that slows it down again. It's the only issue with taking the battery out is that you know, just need to enter the date every time you start it up. All VAX machines have a, a name and must be maximum of six characters. So this one is called Hertz. It's a failure there because I haven't plugged in the network. And it's 
it's booted. Only took four minutes of elapsed time according to that. Time to log in. This machine's only got six meg of RAM. It's about three, 3,300 blocks free, which is about uh, 1.6 megabytes of RAM left. The block's 512 bytes. Have a look at the disk. Got an RD54. Total of 311,000 blocks, which is about 159 meg. And it looks like it's about half full. Okay, so that's pretty much it for today. A shame about the drive failure in the other one, but those drives were never that reliable, even when they were new. Uh, they're old MFM drives, and I don't think they were designed for 24 by 7 usage. The next fax station, the 3000 series, they use SCSI drives which are a lot more reliable. Anyway, thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time.